Welcome to Ask Psych Sessions with Marianne Lloyd, where we ask some of the best teachers we know questions from you, our audience. If you have a question or an idea for a conversation, please visit bit.ly backslash ask psych sessions. That's B-I-T dot L-Y backslash ask psych sessions. All one word, all lowercase. And here's our next question. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest is Dr. Lisa Sun from Barnard College. I'm glad you could join us, Lisa. Thank you for having me. So before we get started with my questions for you, could you just tell the listeners briefly about your uh, research background and the kinds of classes you teach at Barnard and maybe a little bit about Barnard College as an institution in case people aren't familiar? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name's Lisa. I'm really happy to be here. This is my first podcast interview. Um, I've, I've been at Barnard College now for exactly 20 years. I started in 2001. I've loved every single moment of it. Uh, it is an all-women's college, and so most of the classes and students I teach are, are women students, um, but it's also an affiliated school with Columbia University, so I do get a mix of all genders in my classes. Um, the, the research that I do is known as metacognition, and I guess we'll be talking a lot about metacognition, but it's, it's something that I... I heard for the first time when I was a senior in college, when I was actually applying to graduate schools. And at the time, I was working with rats and doing neuroscience and feeding behavior. But I was also very allergic to rats at the time because I had been working so long with them. So I decided that I really wanted to understand human learning and memory. And I was told at my graduate school interview um, that there was a woman um, coming to Columbia University named Janet Metcalf, and she edited this book. And I received that book that day at my interview. So I read the book, um, senior year in college, it was called Metacognition, Knowing About Knowing. So that was actually the first time I heard that word. But the first moment I read, you know, the first chapter, I knew that I wanted to study and do metacognition and be metacognition for the rest of my life, for the rest of my career. And so that's when I first learned of it. And actually, the first time I learned of it, the, it's, the book started with a definition as metacognition being knowing thyself. And, and so this was, this to me, was it was it was really kind of stunning to me as a senior in college as an adult i felt at that moment you know what i don't know myself and so that was the beginning of my journey actually of wanting to to really know myself um but so so i did i went to graduate school and i and i you know ended up at barnard and i continued to do uh research on metacognition. But the metacognitive research has been slightly different than, than kind of the journey of knowing who I am and my own identity. It's been, it's been mostly about, um, you know, how you, how you think about your own learning and thinking. And, and so I guess I'll talk more about that soon. Um, but the classes I've been teaching at Barnard, um, I've been really happy because I've been able to teach a broad range of classes at Barnard, you know, beginning with a, fr a first year class. And this is a seminar that's always 16 students, um, 16 freshmen, and it's a, a course on memory, right? So I don't talk too much about metacognition, but I, I try to get the basics of learning and memory Um you know, kind of taught with these students. So they really understand how to, how to learn as best as they can going forward. Um, the other course that I teach typically is cognitive psychology. And this is my largest course. Typically, I have 100 students or more. And so um, we do talk a lot about metacognition, we have kind of a short, um, you know, week, or maybe two on metacognition. And, um, it's really difficult to implement metacognition in such a large class, but 
I'll talk about that also later. Um, and then finally, I teach a senior or senior level seminar or a graduate level seminar called metacognition or cognitive processes. And the thing that I love about this course is that every single year, I kind of switch the topic depending on what I think is important um, in that year or depending on where my research is going in that particular year. So this past year, um, this semester, in fact, we're just finishing now, the topic, uh, the topics that I chose for this year were two that I think are really important and they're, they're kind of two different uh, parts of metacognition. The first half of the semester, we, we talked about something called hindsight bias right? Or the feeling that you knew it all along, right? The feeling that because you know it now, you had always known it, like you were always a genius, right? Or always an expert. Um, and the second half of the semester, we, we talked about something that I think is so important, so prevalent, and uh, something that we don't talk about very seriously often. And this is known as the imposter phenomenon. Uh, you know, people know of it as the imposter syndrome. They kind of casually talk about, yeah, yeah, totally. I'm an imposter. I have imposter syndrome. But in this semester, we really read up on the literature that's out there, which isn't a lot. And we had, I think, really interesting and honest discussions about, you know, whether, whether we feel like, you know, we, we are an imposter or we don't, we don't belong. Um, and the thing that was really good about it is that the, the students, there were only 20 students in the class, the students were able to open up, right? And, and being a small level, level seminar, they really were able to open up. And we, we, the readings we did really helped us to understand, well, how might such feelings of not belonging or not being as good as the others in, your, in our little society um, you know, how did that develop? And we learned that it, it definitely could have developed, you know, started developing when we were young. And so, so that's been something that I really enjoyed teaching, um, this, this kind of graduate level course on cognitive processes as a big umbrella, but being able to, you know, pick my own topics. Both of those are really interesting examples of metacognition, and I hope we get to, uh, to circle back to both of them. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about this? And you, as you said, um, kind of previewed this idea of metacognition helping us with our learning. Yeah. Uh, how can we use what we know about metacognition in our classrooms to help students learn more effectively, right? Because there's the material piece, which sounds like you would cover in a memory course, but then there's the you piece. That's yeah. the metacognition. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, the, this feeling that, oh my gosh, I need to know who I am. That was my original love for metacognition. But I also came to see how important metacognition was in the learning environment and for all ages. And just to define metacognition a little differently, right? I said that it was kind of the ability to know yourself or to self-identify. But actually, in the research, um, most people will very simply talk about it as cognition about cognition, or the thinking process, evaluating your thinking process. And um, it, it seems kind of simple when you define it that way. But actually, I think it's, it's so difficult, because it's really complicated to implement, right, to really use and incorporate into your own learning. Um, the other way it's def been defined, kind of more formally, is as a two component process. Um, the first component called monitoring, and the second called control. The monitoring and the control components are linked. Um, so here's an example of, of a student learning, right? They might be studying kind of their Spanish, right? Because they have a test the next day. As they're studying, 
they might say to themselves, oh, this is so easy. Yeah, I've studied enough. I know it all. These judgments are part of the monitoring process, right? They're monitoring how their ongoing study is going. So that's, that's the monitoring process. The control process kicks in and is related to that monitor, that monitor, right? So if the student were to say to themselves, yeah, I know this all, this is really easy, then your control process might be close the book, I'm done studying. I don't need to do any more because I know it already. So the behavior, the strategy that you actually implement while you're studying, that's the second component of metacognition. And you can, you can kind of see why it gets a little bit difficult because both the monitor and the control process have to be intact in order for good learning to occur and to be completed sufficiently for you to do well on your upcoming test. And, you know, the, the biggest kind of illusion, the biggest breakdown I think I've seen when students are learning is that their monitor is not working properly, right? They might say to themselves, yeah, I know this all, this is so easy, but actually they might not know it all or not know it deeply enough to, to be retained for the long term, right? Or they might, um, you know, sh kind of show this overconfidence. And the overconfidence might occur because students might simply read through their notes without testing themselves, right? And if, and if you just read through your notes, of course you're going to think it's easy because the answers are all right there. And because this monitor is overconfident or is, is not working properly, then the control process will not occur properly, right? You're just going to say, I'm done study. I'm going to go out and play now. And of course, you're not going to do well on the upcoming test. So, so this is kind of when you, when you read through the metacognitive literature, it's really interesting to me that, and it's kind of sad that most of the metacognitive research is on metacognitive breakdown, right? It's on these illusions and biases that we have while we're studying, right? And, you know, one of the typical ones, some of the ones that I've already talked about is kind of this overconfidence that occurs when you just simply read through the material or simply go through to all the lectures but don't actually test yourself or you don't actually deeply process the material on your own. Um, you know, the other, the other kind of breakdown that occurs that you'll see is that students make these monitoring judgments about the now, right? Do I know this information now? And they, and they fail to take into account how memory works. They fail to know that, oh, you know, in a day, in a couple hours, you know, next week, this might decay, right? I might not know what I know now tomorrow. And because of this illusion, people are, you know, they, they're not going to do as well as they thought they would have on the test tomorrow. And so, you know, even for college students, adult college students who have been very successful in school all their lives, they'll still come to me after an exam and say, you know what, I knew all this material. I studied all night and I knew it all. I don't know what happened. This is one of the kind of most common breakdowns of monitor, mo the monitoring component that I've seen, where students will cram all night, you know, they, they'll study all night simply by reading through everything. And they'll say, yep, I know it all. And they don't realize that in a few hours, that all of that content could have become confused or could have, you know, decayed from their memory processing. And, and so I've seen it and it's very sad. It's simply a, a matter of, you know, can I fix my monitor? Just tweak it a little, 
right, then I'll, I'm going to have a good chance of making good control decisions. Thank you. So much to think about um, in terms of how we can encourage better monitoring in, yeah. in our classes and also just tell students about this, right? They may not know, yeah, but they don't know. Yeah. So, you know, when you ask me now, how do you kind of incorporate this into the classroom? Well, first of all, you know, I think it's a, it's kind of a trick question because, and I, I've talked about this pretty often, but metacognition, you know, kind of like when the first time I read about it and learned about it, it was about, you know, who am I, you know, do I know the Lisa right up to now? And, you know, who is Lisa going forward? Metacognition to me is a very personal and private process. And I think this also generalizes to the learning context. And so when people ask me or teachers ask me, well, how can I incorporate metacognition into the classroom? It's not so easy because, you know, if you have a hundred students or even 10 students in your class, you know, the teacher can't know the private thoughts of each of their students. And, and I wouldn't expect them to, I can't expect myself to know the private metacognitive thoughts of my students or how much they think they're understanding or knowing, you know, when I, when I lecture on the content in the classroom. And so this is a really difficult question to answer. The only thing that I have been able to do is like you say, first kind of increase awareness right? I talk all the time about metacognition. Um, and, you know, not only to my in class students, but just to people I know, students I know, you know, my advisees, right? When I advise my students, especially my first year students about how can they approach their learning? You know, what kind of classes do they want to pick? And why? You know, if, if there are different types of tests, or final projects they need. This, this is all going to depend on their own private metacognition, not on the teacher being able to walk them through their metacognitions. So the first thing that I do is I, you know, I, I talk about day one, I say, you know, what's important to me is, is not this final grade right? Or not the, you know, how much you know now, even during this semester. And I tell them directly that I'll be most impressed when you come visit me as an alum in 10 years, and we're still able to discuss and have, you know, good conversations about the content of the class. Because when I see that people have retained information for the long term, you know, I, I could say very confidently that they've retained it for life, right? They really understand and can use what they're learning to solve future problems, right? And to, to have great creative conversations and discussions with their friends later. Um, but so that's the first thing I do. That's you know, I, I try to I I increase awareness of what this metacognitive process is. It's it's knowing yourself, but it's knowing your own learning strategies. And it's being aware or becoming aware of what works and what doesn't. And then from my point of view, in order to help as much as I can in terms of kind of implementing metacognition in the classroom, I tell students from day one also that this is a syllabus and it's packed with all this content we're going to try to get through. But my goal, my primary goal is not to get through everything. I would rather, you know, kind of slow down my teaching and the interactive process in the classroom um, because I know then that the deeper, you know, students are able to learn and discuss the material with each other and with me, the more long term they're going to be able to retain this material. So I am definitely not a fan of rushing through material 
you know, to get to the end and, and to stay with my syllabus schedule. I don't do that at all. In fact, I add readings. I take out readings, right, depending on how the, the classroom is going throughout the semester. And so, you know, in that sense, metacognition, I think of is really similar to the idea of a student centered approach to learning. Um, the only difference is, is that I try to focus more on the individual. Right. And so, you know, this is I think this is the, the most challenging thing. We always get students in the class who will say, yeah, the, the class went too slowly. And then other students saying, oh, the class went too quickly. So, so this is a metacognitive problem, right? We are all at different levels of the learning curve. You know, even in my cognitive psychology class, I've ta- I've, I have students who are seniors and who've taken other similar lab courses. And then I have some sophomores who've only taken intro psych. So what can I do? So what I try to do is then during the class, right, if, if I see that some people are ahead and some people are not as you know, far ahead, far along, I will actually slow it down. I will, you know, it sounds like I, I'm catering to the slower students, but I think that what we can do during those times is challenge the more advanced students to do some metacognitive work, meaning work on their own learning. You know, it could be as simple as, um, you know, Here's an example, right? I could, you know, let's say I'm talking about the difference between a between subjects and a within subjects design. And maybe some of the, you know, younger students ha- don't really get it yet. So I'm still going through the basic definition and coming up with examples. I might tell, you know, my students, those of you who are, you know, experts on between and within subjects design, I want you to now design an experiment. And why you would use those two different types of designs in your experiments. And so, you know, I try to do as much as I can to, you know, to meet each student at the level they're at. Right. I think it's I think it's really terrible to kind of rush students, you know, to a more challenging level when they're not ready for it, because that just means they're not going to learn anything. And even if it looks like they're learning it now, again, that's short term. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that when you rush through something, especially something that's a little too challenging for your level, it's going to be gone within days. Right. And, and, you know, my goal is always long-term learning. The other thing I do is, um, you know, especially for my cognitive psychology class, um, which is which is generally is hundred students. Um, I can't I can't know where people are at, right? Whether they're understanding or not. So here's what I do: I at the beginning of every class, I basically put up two questions on the board or on the slide or in the chat. Right. I put up two questions that are kind of a review test. They're kind of quizzes, but not graded at all. Right. They're quizzes from the day before the class before, which is typically two or three days prior. And and I don't talk about the answer. I don't put up an answer. I certainly don't do multiple choice because I don't like giving wrong answers. (laughs) I just put up questions. And I trust that the students are thinking about it, thinking about what this question's asking, or for my more expert students who think they already know it all or think they have the answer, how would you ask it differently? Right? If you were going to now write an exam that tested this concept that you learned last class, how it write down your own test question. And what I love about doing here is that I've seen my students, you know, some of my students will be like, oh my gosh, I, I, I can't remember. And it's only been two days, <laughs> right? They're starting to become aware that, you know, oh my gosh, decay happens. And when I use my monitor, 
I better keep that in mind so that when I'm studying on my own, I have to think, okay, in two days, in five days, in a month, how should I study or test myself or come up with my own questions uh, to, to kind of approach this concept from as many different con- you know, angles as possible? And that, I think, has really helped. The other thing, and this is the other kind of uh, more philosophical metacognitive aspect that I love, is I, I just a moment ago, I used the word trust. I trust that my students will read the question and come up with possible solutions. I don't give them the answer. You know, let's say I feel like I don't have a lot of time in this class period and I put up the question and after two minutes I say, okay, well, here's the answer. I think that's a really bad strategy because some students might be just sitting there like, I don't know, and not doing anything. We've all seen, we've all felt lazy, right? We just want to get the answer. This is a really bad way to teach thinking about thinking. So, and, and I'll tell students that I'll say, here's the question. If you can't figure it out now within a few minutes, I trust that you'll get it. I trust that you'll revisit this, right? I trust that you have the basic concepts in your mind that you'll get there and thinking takes a while, right? So the, with these questions, I don't expect that the students will come up with the answers like that, right? And then we can go on in class. I, I want my students to understand that metacognition is not a process that you learn very quickly or, you know, fully at all. You know, I want students to know that the metacognitive process is about being able to think through a problem when you don't know the answer and not being afraid of that. You know, that's, that's something that I think is, has been really difficult to get over myself and also teach my students to get over, right? The idea that before you even start thinking about the possible solutions to a problem, you know, you might think, yeah, I'm really bad at these types of problems. So yeah, what's the answer? Or, you know, you know, psychology, it's, it's too abstract for me. I don't think I can major in it, even though I want to. Or, you know, it has too many numbers in it. I have math anxiety. I'm not a math person. Before even starting the thinking process, uh, people are really scared. And the sad thing about it is that it means people are scared to be metacognitive because the monitoring process is, process takes time. And so, you know, that's the thing I, I think about a lot with my students. And, and I try in my class to show that I trust you And if someone says to me ever, which I hear a lot, actually, you know, I'm not a math person. I'm not a graph person. I'm not this person or that person. That already shows me that they're not using metacognition because they're not starting the monitor, right? The monitor begins when you understand what the question is or what the problem is. That's when you start to judge your own thinking, and how it's going. But if you just read the question and it's a mathy type of question and you say, yeah, I'm not going to know this. It means you've cut, you've already cut off the metacognitive process for yourself and, and you can't kind of train it up. You know, I think of metacognition as kind of this muscle where you, you know, you need to, you need to have the trust that you can make a good monitor. You know, you can make a judgment. You might not be perfect because our judgments aren't perfect, but you can improve um, little by little by actually doing it and by actually making mistakes in your monitor. And that's the only way you can improve the monitoring process. Um, so those are, those are, that's kind of what I do at the beginning of each of my classes, regardless of what, what, level they're at. And, and I think it's a good way for students to kind of 
approach the content and the material at their own level. Right. And, and that's what metacognition is, you know, so they're not going to think, oh, this is too hard or this is too easy. They all have something to assess and evaluate about their own thinking. Um, so. So, yeah, is that. Uh, that's great. Shit. OK, so yes. thank you. That's lots of notes yeah. to write in my syllabus for my future self. Uh, cause yeah. I was like, oh, I'm I do some of those things and I really like the part you said about not rushing things. So yeah. to that end, do you think you might be willing, because we're about out of time, to come back and talk about the imposter things on a follow-up episode? Oh, can I get definitely. you to come back? Really interesting date. I would love to. But can I just say one more thing? Yes, I please. know that it's it's getting longer, but one thing about the other thing I do in my classes, especially um the cognitive psychology class, which is a larger class, I know a lot of faculty use multiple choice exams because that's that's kind of reasonable, right? It's how to, you know we we have to be able to grade them in some reasonable amount of time. I don't, and I haven't for several years now. I think that the multiple choice process, the multiple choice exam, first of all, it scares students, especially students who are not using their metacognitions. It also uh, provides incorrect answers. And because faculty also don't necessarily go through the finished exam, right? Sometimes students will just mark the incorrect answer and they'll never return to that content again. It means for the rest of their lives, they might know the wrong answer. <laughs> and so I just, there's so many things, you know, it also gives people the illusion when they're studying, they might say, yeah, I just need to be able to recognize the answer. So I'm not going to study as much as deeply as, you know, I maybe should if it were a different type of exam. So here's what I do. I tell people, you know, first of all, Ew, I don't like multiple choice exams and I don't want to give my students incorrect information for them to learn the rest of their lives. Um, and, and people will say to me, yeah, but I can't do short answer essay exams. It's, it takes too long to grade. I totally understand this and I, I can't do that either. But what I do is I use a kind of compromise and I use only short answer questions, but all of my short answer questions are all figures. And, you know, it, it's so in cognitive psychology, every concept we go through, every theory we go through, we also go through an experiment or more. Um, so they really understand how an experiment is conducted, what a design is, what the data might look like, and how to interpret a graph, right, or a table. And so in, in my exam, I might have only 20 questions but none of them are multiple choice. None of them are writing sentences, right? They're not an essay, right? It's not an English exam, but it's all about making a chart, a table, a figure, or fixing a figure, right? So if it's about, do you remember the results of this study? Is this correct or not? If it's incorrect, can you fix it? It might be about filling in the axes labels, Right. If I'm looking at Ebbinghaus's, you know, forgetting function, what are the axes labels? Um, so this is actually very quick for me to grade. Right. I could just look for the key parts of the figure or the, the table that I'm looking for. And it also, I think, is a way to get students to really deeply think about that experiment or that concept. It's been really, I think, totally successful for me. And I think students have also enjoyed it because they really, you know, they really have to push themselves to understand how an experiment works from beginning to end. So this is this is what I, the only thing I do now in cognitive psychology. And of course, in my other courses, they're smaller classes. So I do have longer papers and essays for them. So that's good for them. But I really wanted to say that this has been, I think, just the best thing in my teaching is how I test. And it, it has nothing to do with multiple choice. And I will never return to that again in my entire teaching career. 
Well, that's great. That's an, another surprise nugget that maybe we'll get some listener feedback and some ideas. My wheels are cranking about maybe making some adjustments to my communal to final and methods. So thank you again so much for sharing everything. It was delightful to get to talk to you. And thank you. I hope to see you in person soon since you aren't far. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Sure thing. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.